that obedience is salvific. In the Orthodox Church and our spiritual tradition, we talk a lot about obedience, but as modern Westerners, we don't understand obedience very well. Our society teaches us that everyone should be stubbornly independent, uh, completely self-sufficient and self-determining, and no one can tell you what you should do or what you should be even to the extent that we think we can determine our own gender, regardless of what God made our body to be. So, is obedience a monastic virtue? Does it apply to everybody? And if so, how? We know for sure that we want to avoid the two extremes, that is, the one of stubborn independence and the other of blind obedience. So, what is obedience? The Greek word that we get obedience from, that we translate it from, is epakoi, and it means to listen, to hearken, to listen and respond, or to submit and obey. In Russian, the word is poslushania, and that's also similarly based on the root word to listen. So we tend to think of obedience as like an institutional rule. A prisoner must be obedient to the guards. There's, this is a, a direct command and response. But the words we're talking about here, listening and responding, conversing, submitting, these are relational words. So what if we, as an experiment, what if we just tried to replace obedience and we said, wives, hearken to your husbands. Children, hearken to your parents. People, hearken to your clergy. I think that sounds better. Uh, I think it's more understandable, besides the fact that I like the word hearken. <laughs> um, so to listen to someone implies honoring them respecting them for what they have to say, what they think, loving them, a curiosity to hear something outside of yourself, to hear something that conveys the inside state of the other person. And this kind of listening that we're talking about is not a passive state, it is active. It means paying attention. It means contemplating what people say, how does it relate to yourself, eventually making a decision, and, and responding. This is an active virtue. So, ipakui in the scriptures, in the New Testament especially, is used frequently to designate Christians before they used the term Christian. So those who are obedient to the word, those who are obedient to the Lord, this is even a, a term that they use for the conversion of the Gentiles, bringing them into obedience. So, for the apostles and the early Christians, obedience is synonymous with faith. I think that answers our question as to whether or not obedience is just for monastics. So, this is a, another level of obedience. We talk about uh, being obedient to our spouses, our leaders, our families. Uh, but, of course, there's this whole other level of being obedient to God, being obedient to the gospel. We are the disciples of Christ. So that means that we must listen to him, hearken to him, and respond. But there's still more. The Lord saved us through obedience. St. Paul says 
in Romans that by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. And Christ is the one who humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death on a cross. This is not an institutional obedience that we're talking about. God the Father did not command the Son, you must die on the cross. No, the Son of God, as one of the Trinity, took part in the pre-eternal counsel of God, hearkened to it, and responded by living out the path of our salvation. And this is, are you ready for a, a theological word? This is the perichoresis of the Trinity. Perichoresis, in its etymology, it means like a dance around the field. So it's, it's this continual cycle in the Trinity's life of always deferring to the other that God the Father gives preference to the Son and the Spirit, and the Son gives preference to the Father and the Spirit, and the Spirit gives preference to the Father and the Son. And as each one gives preference to the other, it comes back to them in return. So this is, this is the blessed state that God lives in of mutual obedience, and it's this blessedness that God wanted us to live in. This is why he created us, so that we could share in his blessed, loving obedience. But rela relationship is always a two-way street. So Christ, in his obedience, opened the path for our salvation. He opened the means of our redemption. But, listen to what St. Paul says, Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. He became salvation by his obedience to those who are obedient. Through, through, excuse me, through obedience, he worked salvation for those who obey him. So, Obedience is a condition of our salvation. It's not enough for us to just let Christ do it for us. Okay, he was obedient to the Father, so that's enough obedience and we'll just let him do it. No, we have to imitate him. We have to hearken unto him and respond by being like him. But here's the thing. The Apostle John said that whoever says that he loves God but hates his brother is a liar. And it's equally true that if we say we are obedient to God, but there is no one in our practical life that we are obedient to, then we are probably also liars, deceiving ourselves. If we think we can be one thing inside, say inside, in my soul I'm obedient to God, but in my body I'm obedient to no man, then we will be a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So, we must have at least one person in our life, or more, whom we listen to, whom we are obedient to, who can be a guide in our life, who has a say in what we do. This is why the tradition of spiritual fathers is so important in the life of the church, because we should not make ourselves the ultimate guide. If we are the sole guide for our own life, then we are standing in the place of God, and this is self-worship, and it makes us very easy prey for the demons. It's trouble. So, we need to not make ourselves God, but make ourselves the disciples. Make ourselves the students, the disciples of Christ, and through him, of all those who, who teach the ways of Christ. And my spiritual father taught me that in doing this, we trust God in the other person. So obedience to a person is not 
a denial of obedience to Christ. It is not an unfaithfulness. It is a recognition that Christ is with us, in front of us, present in the other person, especially that person who believes in Christ, who receives the sacraments, and is obedient to him and to the gospel. So let us take up the cross of obedience and pray for me that I might also. Let us listen with curiosity, respond with our whole heart, and obey out of love for Christ. This is a blessed path. It's a path of openness, a path of relationship, and of holy humility. It is a path that will lead us to the blessed state that the Holy Trinity lives in, for which we were all created. Oh, we-